All right, well, um, this evening we are again returning to Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, but rather than reading it, since I'm planning on reading the portions we're going to be looking at piece by piece, I'll just read it as we go along. So let me just begin with a little bit of review. This morning, um, we noted that um, we need to guard our hearts against a negative reaction to God's commandments, not only to the fourth commandment, but, but all of them. Uh, we do need to remember that where that comes from, of course, it comes from sin, that's, that's never good. Uh, we need to remember that, that God, uh, the Lord, which can refer either to the Father or to the Son, uh, Yahweh, uh, is the Lord, and as the Lord, He has the right to command us because we are His servants. But we also need to remember that He has made it, I'd say, relatively easy. You know, He's made obedience easy. It's not effortless. I wish it were. Uh, we still, because we still have to struggle with sin that's inside of us, but certainly He has made it not only possible, but He has made it more than possible because in the New Covenant, He does give us the Holy Spirit who gives us the want to, the willingness to do these things so that John can write what we've already seen in our meditation um, uh, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. When the commandments appear to be burdensome to us, the problem is sin. The problem is not the commandment, and that's the way we need to see it. Uh, certainly, um, Jesus never had any difficulty with, with the commandments. They weren't a burden to Him. He didn't find them difficult because He had that kind of affection that God gives to us. Although he had it in greater measure, it's still of the same kind, right? Jesus, speaking prophetically through David in Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, says this, Behold, I come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Why? Your law is within my heart. Does that sound familiar? You know, the law of God was in the heart of Christ. The blessing of the new covenant is I will take that law on the tablets of stone and I will put them upon your hearts. The blessing of the new covenant is that God makes us like Jesus. And certainly if the law is on our hearts, then the fourth commandment will be there as well, our desire to keep it even as Jesus did. But now again, in order to do this, remember, to have this time with the Lord, there are certain things He tells us that we need to set aside. And the first of these is our work, and that's what we want to look at this evening. Now, let's get into the language of the commandment and again look at what it actually says. The first thing it says in verse 8 is this, remember the Sabbath day. Okay, that, that's really what I want us to think about first, remembering the Sabbath day. God tells us first that we need to remember this, uh, I think because we're all too likely to forget this day. I don't think we forget that it exists, although in today's you know, evangelical world, uh, most churches don't give it a second thought. It's not being preached from the pulpits. It seems to be something that's centered mainly in Reformed churches, but not all Reformed churches even do it. So it, it does seem to be largely forgotten. It's perhaps not that we, you know, don't remember the fact that we're obligated to keep it because it is in the Ten Commandments, and we do read that quite often, but I think what the Lord means by this is that we tend, perhaps you know, on this particular commandment, not to want to do what it actually tells us to do. Maybe it's because life is so busy that we don't really feel like we can spare the time, you know, um, that may have something to do with it, or maybe it's because, you know, we're so, we enjoy, I don't know, recreations and sports so much that we just can't break away from it. You know, again, I mentioned this morning, I'm sure all of us are aware, that there are many professing Christians that perhaps aren't worshiping in the evening because they wanted to watch the Super Bowl. But I think perhaps the main reason that we want to forget that the Sabbath exists is because of our enemies. Okay, our enemies are working against us because they don't want us to keep it. And I'm talking about our spiritual enemies. The devil certainly does not want us to spend this day with God 
because he knows that if we do, we'll become stronger and more able to resist him. Um, he'll use the world, certainly, to try to distract us uh, in, you know, trying to keep us from this, uh, from this day. Not necessarily the things that we shouldn't do, okay, uh, though he will also do that, but the things we can do. And again, I'm thinking of, you know, things that might be uh, allowable or that are allowable on other days of the week, such as work, you know, got to get this done today. I'm not going to have time the rest of the week. And so we, we tend to kind of justify the fact that we have to do it today because it's the only day I can. That makes it necessary. And we know works of necessity are allowed on the Sabbath. So the fact that I can't really find the time on other days means that I can do it on this day and the devil might do that. Or, of course, he may also use play. You know, again, recreation. And that's something we're going to look at in a later sermon. Um, he uses that to distract us, to try to draw us away from spending this time that we need. And certainly there's not only the devil and the world, but there's also our flesh. Our flesh is working against us because it knows, it almost seems to have a mind of its own. It's contrary to the will of God. Uh, the flesh is a part of us, but it knows, it understands that if we spend this day with the Lord, it will make it grow weaker. It won't be able to exert the influence that it might otherwise. And that's the reason why when we think about, you know, time to spend with the Lord, as John Owen says, you know, during the week when we're trying to find that time, it's hard to find because when we find it, our flesh will try to divert us to do anything but that. Well, if it's going to do that during the week, what is it going to do when it comes to an entire day that we spend with the Lord? So our enemies are fighting with us to get us to forget this day. But if we are to overcome these enemies, we need to remember it. And so that's why the Lord says, remember the Sabbath day. Now, secondly, he says we are to remember to keep this day holy. Now, we've already spent time on this, so I'm just going to mention a couple things. That we do need to set it apart from the other six. We need to give it to God. We need to spend it with Him. That's the whole purpose of the day. So that we might worship Him publicly. That we might worship Him privately. That we might spend time with brothers and sisters focusing on the things that have to do with the Lord to build each other up in faith. The amount of time that we are to set aside is, remember, a day. It's the day that is holy, not the, the hour or the hour and a half that we meet together for worship. That's, again, how other people understand the fourth commandment. Remember the, the worship service on Sunday to keep it holy, but the rest of the day you can kind of do what you want to do. The Lord says, remember the Sabbath day, okay, to keep it holy. Now, again, what does that mean? Because really all of our time is holy time, right? It's, it all belongs to the Lord as we belong to Him. And the Lord calls us to use every moment that we have, every moment of life, every thought, every word, everything we do for His glory. I mean, Jesus, that's what Jesus meant when He said, pick up your cross if you're going to follow me. You got to die to yourself and you need to commit yourself to doing things the way that I would have you do it. That's what Paul means when he says that we are to present our bodies as living and holy sacrifices acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of worship. All of life is to be worshiped to God. And when Paul further says, whether then we eat or drink or whatever we do, do it all to the glory of God. So all of our time belongs to the Lord. All of our time is to be holy. So what does he mean when he says, keep this day holy? Well, what he means is that we are to devote ourselves to him on this day even more fully in particular ways. We serve him on really every day, but we serve him in a different way on this day. Not entirely different, but the majority of the day is to be spent primarily in worship and just drawing near to God. That's, that's a service of God. That's something we are to do on other days but something we don't have a lot of time to do on other days because of the things that get in the way. 
So the Lord gives us this day to spend more time on this particular uh, duty that we have to draw near to Him in worship. Now to do this, we need to set certain things aside, okay? And the first and most obvious thing we need to set aside is our work, and that's what the commandment actually says in verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. That, that's fairly plain, isn't it? It seems rather absolute. On this day, don't do any work. Now, obviously, it's not because there's anything wrong with work, right? Work is good. Work is a good thing. Work is why God created us. All of our work is to be done for the glory of God. We know He created Adam and Eve to work. But we can't work and worship God in the way He calls us to at the same time. The two are mutually exclusive, which is why He calls us to rest from our work so that we can worship Him. By the way, that's another reason why the Sabbath is a blessing to us. You know, we saw it was a blessing this morning because it gives us time to spend developing our relationship with the one whom we love the most. But God has also given us this day to be a day of rest from our work so that we might be refreshed. If we were to work nonstop without ever taking a break, you know, we would burn out prematurely. Uh, there's probably some great examples of this in church history of uh, some people we respect, uh, Spurgeon and perhaps to see who else uh, falls into this category, but people who work so strenuously, uh, George Whitfield, so they ended up dying early. Perhaps it's because they already believed that they had kind of lived beyond their life expectancy that they were willing to do that. But if they had spent perhaps a little bit more time resting, uh, they might not have um, perhaps died so quickly. God gives us six days to work. I mean, again, work is good. Six days you shall labor. And by the way, you know, we want to notice here too that work is something that is not only good, but something that is commanded Six days you shall work, but in those six days, he says, do all of your work. The seventh day is a day of rest. On it, he says, you shall not do any work. So what does he, what does he mean by that? Well, it, it's kind of obvious, right? Certainly no vocational work. What we do for a living is to be done on that day. Housekeeping. That's work, right? We don't do housekeeping on that day. Bookkeeping, shopping, home repair, projects, yard work, car maintenance. I mean, those are just a few things. That, that's work. That's, those are things that we are to rest from doing. Now, again, there's many more things. I, I can't give you an exhaustive list, but I think that kind of covers the main things that we might be tempted to do. Now, there are exceptions, some really important exceptions to this as we're going to see, but the rule is we are not to do any work, but we are to rest. Now, the commandment goes further than this, and sometimes we miss this as well. Not only are we not to work, we're also not to cause others to work on this day. He says in verse 10, you or your son or your daughter your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. By the way, in those days, that was a comprehensive list of everyone that could possibly work. Everyone is supposed to rest. Now, if we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and we know that it, God calls us not to work, not only should we not work, but we should also not cause others to work. Now, he says this applies to our children. Now, most of our children are grown out of the house, so this may be kind of a moot point, although there's still some who are raising their children. This means that we should make our children work on the Lord's Day, doing you know, particular chores that, that fall into a category that really don't need to be done. Now, they do need to take care of personal hygiene, personal grooming. I think uh, that's just 
respectful. But um, as far as the other things, like I don't know, weeding the yard or whatever, things of that nature, those are for other days. If we have company, you know, the sojourner who stays with you, sometimes we do have people in our homes, and sometimes they want to show their appreciation for us by helping us do things, maybe helping us with certain projects. Well, they shouldn't do that, and we shouldn't really let them do those things for us on the Lord's day. Now, we don't have any servants in, you know, in our culture, um, but there are situations where people do work for us, or at least potentially can work for us. People who own their own businesses have employees. They, they shouldn't make them work on the, the Lord's Day. Uh, when we hire contractors, when we hire handymen, they work for us. They become servants. You know, we're paying them to do this work, but they are serving us. When we go to restaurants, there are people there who wait on us, who cook food for us. The Lord tells us that we are not to cause other people to work on the Lord's Day. I'm not sure if you've ever thought about that, but they need to rest. And the reason why they need to rest is because they too are called to worship the Lord. Even if they don't do it, that's what they should be doing. Now, you know, there was a time not too long ago when most businesses were closed. And I think they called them blue laws. Some of them still exist. They were all shut down on Sundays. That happened even in my lifetime. You know, most stores were closed when I was growing up on Sunday. And you know what? Nobody was the worse for it. Everybody had what they needed. They just simply took care of those things at, at other times. Most business owners today think that if they close their business on Sunday, that they're going to go out of business. Well, you know, Chick-fil-A is one of those rare exceptions, one of those rare companies that is very, very popular. People love Chick-fil-A. But as far as I know, they still are closed on Sundays, right? And not only have they not been hurt by that, and by the way, they also weren't hurt by the fact that they took a stand against homosexual marriage, okay? They were doing what was honoring to the Lord. And as they did, the Lord blessed them. As I understand, their business is booming. The Lord blesses those who put Him first. Now again, he intends the Sabbath to be a day of rest for all mankind, for everyone. He instituted it at the end of the creation week and gave it as a blessing to Adam and Eve, but not only to them. It was meant to be for all of their children, for the entire human race. And that is actually the fact, or that continues today. That is what God desires, that everyone would rest so that they might worship him. You know, the Lord says even the animals are supposed to be given a rest. Now, I don't think that means we need to not drive our cars because they don't need rest, okay? It may be true your car will last a little bit longer if you don't drive it on this day, but it doesn't get fatigued, okay? <laughs> now, the word here for cattle uh, means living creatures, and it can refer to all different types of animals. But I think it likely refers to the animals that they would use to help them with their work. You know, if they're not going to be working, their animals need to also take that day of rest because it will help them. It will prolong their lives. You won't run them into the ground. Plus, you're not supposed to be working on that day anyway. Cultures that continue to use animals today should not use their animals on the Lord's day to do any, any labor. So the rule is all are not to work, but they are to rest so that everyone can worship the Lord. <clears throat> but as I've said, there are important exceptions to this rule, and we need to look at these um, in this context. The Westminster Assembly called them works of necessity and mercy. Uh, Wilhelmus Abrockel, if you're not familiar with that name, he um, was a very uh, famous theologian, Dutch theologian and pastor of the late 17th century who lived in the Netherlands and uh, was influenced by Puritan theology and he was a part of, I think it was called the Second Reformation uh, in the Netherlands. He, uh, uh, well, within our lifetime, his works have been translated into English and so we have access to them now. They're in the library if you're interested. It's called The Christian's Reasonable Service. A very um, thorough, four volumes, and practical in that it applies all the theology that he teaches to our lives. But anyway, he breaks these exceptions down into three categories. 
The first one he calls religious labors. There's, there's religious work, and he says this. Such as when ministers preach in the sweat of their brow and whatever else transpires in the realm of religion. The priests killed the animals on the Sabbath day and nevertheless did not sin. He basically says this is based upon Jesus' statement to the Pharisees in Matthew 12, 5. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? Okay, there is certain work that needs to be done on the Sabbath. If we're going to gather together for worship, well, there's going to be some that have to do some work. And some of that work might even require a little bit of sweat. I think other examples of this would be evangelism. You know, we can evangelize. We can do missionary work. Perhaps radio and TV broadcasting, at least if we're, if we're broadcasting the truth. Life chains, where we're standing up for the gospel and for the unborn. And many other ways of reaching out with the gospel. I suppose if a Gideon Bible distribution would work on the Lord's Day, that'd be perfectly fine, but at most schools aren't in, in session at that time. Now, the second uh, exception he calls works of absolute necessity, which are necessarily engendered by unexpected events on the Sabbath, be it that a fire breaks out, a person falls in the water, etc. Jesus says in Luke 14 verse 5, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? I mean, it's the Sabbath. You're not going to let your son drown in the well. You're not going to let your animals, you know, you're going to act to preserve life. Certainly that is, is acceptable. And I think there's a lot of vocations that fall into that category. What if all the police officers in the city took the day off? What would happen? Well, something we wouldn't want to happen. Their work is, is necessary. Highway patrolmen, firemen, doctors, nurses falls into this category. I think we could also argue that those who maintain certain, um, uh, what would you call them, machinery in order to keep the utilities running, to keep the hospitals going, uh, to preserve the things that we have, I think we would also say those things are necessary. Other things might include, let's say you're, you're on your way to church, you know, on, on uh, Sunday and, and you get a flat tire. Do you have to just wait there for Monday to come before you can fix it? No, you can change the tire if you're able to do that. You can call AAA and the person who comes out to help you will be doing something that needs to be done on that particular day. You can also prepare food, take care of your personal hygiene. Those are things that, that are necessary. And then the third category. By the way, these categories can all really be, I think, summarized by, by one category. These are things that are, in some way, works of, of mercy. You know, they are necessary, and many of these necessary things are merciful things. But the third category is works of mercy, such as caring for the sick, and some of the labors of pharmacists, doctors, surgeons, and midwives that is, as far as helping women in need and women giving birth to a child. This also pertains to feeding cattle in the winter, providing protection against the enemy, etc. Then it holds true, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It was meant to be a blessing, not a burden. It was meant to help us, not hurt us. It wasn't meant to endanger our lives. Okay? Remember how Jesus defended his disciples against the accusations of the Pharisees when they accused them of breaking the Sabbath because they were picking heads of grain on the Sabbath. They were simply taking care of, of a need. It was a merciful act okay, to eat food. Okay? They were traveling. They needed food. They, they had the right by the law to glean in the field. That's what they did, and there was nothing wrong with that. Jesus also healed many people on that day. And he said in Matthew 12, verse 12, So then, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So again, doctors and nurses can care for patients. Even if it's not emergency work, they still need to be cared for. Farmers can feed their livestock. Sometimes Dick needs to irrigate on Sundays in order to keep his trees alive because that's the only day that he has the water. Guards can protect property. I mean, let's say prison guards 
took, took the day off on Sunday, what would happen in the prisons? So there are things that can be done because they're acts, either religious acts or they're um, necessary or they are merciful. And I think there are also instances where work that typically isn't necessary can become necessary as an act of mercy. I mean, what if you have a sick, sick somebody in your household on the Lord's Day and you don't have what you need in order to take care of them? You can go to the store and get those things. What about restaurants, you know, that, that are serving a lot of people that really don't need to be served? There may be some instances where they do need to be served. And I think there was a great illustration of this given years ago by a former member who used to live in Holland. And he said there was a Christian man who ran an inn. And, you know, there's a difference between an inn and a hotel. An inn has a, has a restaurant built into it. Now, he would close that restaurant to outside business, to people who just wanted to have a nice meal but <clears throat> didn't really need it. They could have prepared their own food. But instead, they're making other people prepare the food for them. So he would close the restaurant to outside business on the Sabbath, but he would still have the kitchen open and he would have the, the cooks and the waiters waiting on those who were in the inn, who were traveling from other, other countries, other cities, who needed that service. You see, for them, that would be an act of necessity or an act of mercy. So he would provide those meals for them at no cost. That, that, that's interesting, isn't it? very gracious of him. He also would give his housekeepers the day off. They wouldn't clean the rooms so that they wouldn't have to do any work on the Sabbath. You see, it is possible to do it. You know, sometimes it may be inconvenient for some, but it can be done. But the, the point I want us to see is simply this. Our Lord tells us not to work on the Sabbath, on the Lord's day, so that we can spend the day with him. But there are exceptions reaching out with the gospel, acting to protect life and property, helping our neighbor who is in need, um, and uh, you know, not, not, um, basically not to do unnecessary work, but to do those things that, if we didn't do, would actually be dishonoring to, to God. Now, one last thing um, that I think we should think about in this category, and by the way, we could go on for a long, long time about this, but I think we get the rules, we get the, the groundwork. Even though there are vocations that are, that are engaged in you know, acts of religion, you know, uh, ministry, uh, works of, of absolute necessity like policemen, firemen, highway patrolmen, and so forth, and you know, even though it would be legitimate for them to break the Sabbath, so to speak, by working in those vocations. I think if we had a vocation like that, and I have encouraged those who, in the past, when we had people like that in the congregation, um, we should still try to arrange our work schedules so that they allow us to worship on that day if we possibly can. Uh, sometimes, you know, people that work all the time on, on Sundays, maybe they're doctors or nurses, the work they're doing is legitimate work, but what if they miss worship every single Lord's Day and are never able to actually gather together with God's people as we're commanded in Scripture also to do? I think that they should try to work their schedule so that they can come as much as they possibly can. But on those days, of course, they need to work. They shouldn't feel guilty about that. But know that they are doing something which the Lord gives them a blessing in doing as they minister uh, to other people. Now, next week, we're going to look at the second major thing that we need to set aside, which is uh, recreation, and we'll look at some other things, perhaps close the topic next Lord's Day. Uh, other things that will help us, other things we need to think about that will help us honor the Lord on this day and get the, you know, the best, make the best use of this day to draw near to Him. But let's, uh, let's just bow for a moment of prayer, and, and with what we've, we've heard Let's just ask the Lord to help us, again, take what we've heard and, and use it in a way that will help us to grow in our relationship with Him.